Sweden has a secret weapon, but no one is talking about it. Right here, deep in the Nordic wilderness and just south of the Arctic Circle, lie two towns that are quietly emerging as potential game changers. Not just for Sweden, but Europe at large. This is really an important day for Sweden and for the whole of the European Union. What's unfolding here could reshape the global balance of power in ways we haven't seen before. You see, for decades the world has relied on China to supply two critical resources, rare earth elements and lithium ion batteries. They're necessary for modern technology, from mobile phones to electric vehicles and even missiles. China controls over 70% of the world's rare earth elements and Chinese firms have a 63% share of the global lithium ion battery industry. This dual monopoly on two of the world's most important resources has put countries in a tricky position, chaining them to a single superpower for technological advancement and national security. But China's dominance is now being challenged and Sweden, a historically neutral country, is becoming a valuable player in this high stakes game. In today's video, I want to show you what's going on in these two Swedish towns and why they're so important for Europe's future. Before we travel up north to Sweden, let's first take a trip east to understand how China's current monopolistic powers came to be. The year is 1987 and former Chinese president Deng Xiaoping is on tour in Baotou in Inner Mongolia. Xiaoping has set China on a trajectory to transform the country from a closed, centrally planned economy to a more open, market-oriented powerhouse. And the city of Baotou is going to play a key role. Just 120 kilometers south of the city is the Bayan Obo Mining District, the world's largest deposit of rare earth elements. It represents approximately 45% of the global rare earth element production. Xiaoping knows exactly what he wants to do with Baotou. During his tour, he calmly announces, the Middle East has oil, China has rare earths. But China wasn't the only country with access to these minerals. Rare earth elements, a group of 17 metals, are precious, but they're not necessarily rare. They're distributed in various places around the world, including Japan, Australia, Canada, and the United States. But the process of extracting and refining them is tricky. It's a complex, expensive, and environmentally challenging task. And so throughout the 90s, as governments imposed strict environmental regulations, many Western countries decided to shift away from domestic rare earths refinement. Instead, they outsourced this dirty work to China, effectively handing them a monopoly. But China's ambitions extended beyond rare earth elements. As a rising global power, China recognized the strategic importance of controlling other critical resources as well. So they went after lithium too, a key component in the fast-growing field of battery technology. Nicknamed white gold, lithium has become synonymous with modern tech and clean energy. This soft silver white metal is a cornerstone of lithium ion batteries, which power everything from smartphones, laptops, electric vehicles, and large scale energy storage systems. China's foresight in recognizing lithium's potential was similar to its approach to rare earth elements. But unlike rare earths, China doesn't have the largest reserves of lithium. Those are found in countries like Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Where China has excelled instead is in the processing of lithium into a form suitable for battery production. You see, over the past two decades, China has aggressively built up its domestic lithium refining and battery manufacturing capabilities. This approach has positioned China as a central player in the global lithium ion battery supply chain, enabling it to control a significant portion of the battery production process from raw material to finished product. China's control over these resources means it has a significant say in the global tech economy and by extension in the geopolitical landscape, something the US government is starting to get extremely worried about. And China has not shied away from using its monopoly as leverage. In September 2010, a Chinese fishing boat collided with two Japanese Coast Guard patrol boats near the Senkaku Islands in the East China Sea. These islands are subject to a territorial dispute between China, Japan, and Taiwan, where all three have claimed sovereignty over the islands. During the boat collision, Japanese authorities arrested the Chinese captain. This upset China, who demanded the immediate release of the captain, arguing that the arrest was illegal since, in their view, the incident occurred occurred in Chinese territorial waters. And so in response to the arrest, China halted its export of rare earth elements to Japan. Now, this move wasn't officially acknowledged as a ban by the Chinese government. They said they had to do it because of environmental concerns, but the timing of the ban was widely interpreted as a retaliatory measure. Japan, which is a major consumer of rare earths for its high-tech industry, now faced a supply crisis. The prices of rare earth elements soared, impacting electronics and car manufacturers worldwide. The situation escalated to a point where diplomatic negotiations were required to resolve the tension. The Chinese captain was eventually released and the rare earth exports to Japan resumed. 
But the incident had a lasting impact. It served as a wake-up call for the international community about the risks of supply concentration in critical resources. This is probably something Peter Carlson and Paolo Ceruti had in mind as they were making their way through Tesla's factory in Fremont. The Swede and the Italian had arrived in California in 2012 to lead Tesla's supply chain operations. Peter, who was 42 at the time, was quickly becoming a supply chain and manufacturing expert, especially in the world of batteries. Before joining Tesla, he had worked at NXP Semiconductors in Singapore and Sony Ericsson in Sweden. Remember this thing? Sony Ericsson was one of the first companies to integrate high-quality cameras and music playback features into mobile phones. And during his time at the company, Peter was tasked with buying billions of dollars worth of batteries for the phone from suppliers such as Panasonic. But this was far from easy, there just weren't enough batteries for him to buy. Paolo, on the other hand, had graduated with a degree in aerospace engineering and spent 15 years working at Renault-Nissan in France. It was Peter who convinced Paolo to ditch Paris and join him at Tesla in California instead. At Tesla, as the two Europeans were mapping out the supply chain for the new Model S, it dawned on them that battery cells were a critical strategic asset. Iterating on Peter's realization while at Sony Ericsson, there was simply no way the global supply of batteries would be able to meet the future demand, especially as electric vehicles would become more mainstream. To prepare for this, Tesla decided to build its own battery factory in Nevada. As Peter and Paolo worked on the groundbreaking Gigafactory project, they realized that Europe was lagging behind in the battery manufacturing race. Then one day, in the middle of the night, Peter gets a call from Europe. It's Kalle Lagerkrantz, the founder of Vargas Holding, a Stockholm-based investment firm that he co-founded with private equity investor Harald Mix. It's 4am in Palo Alto, but Peter isn't phased by the timing. He's used to getting calls from Elon Musk at all hours of the night. Kalle has been following Peter's work from afar and wants to discuss the potential for European battery manufacturing. Good timing because Peter had been thinking about the exact same thing. This led to several follow-up meetings in Stockholm where they dissected the battery value chain and outlined the industry's future. Together with Vargas Holding, Peter and Paolo envisioned creating Europe's response to the Gigafactory. But they didn't want to just replicate Tesla's version. They wanted to create something even better. The goal was to build the world's greenest battery cell, a high-capacity lithium-ion battery with the lowest possible carbon footprint. You see, while Tesla's gigafactories were pivotal in scaling up battery production and reducing costs, Peter and Paolo wanted to build a factory that would set new environmental standards. This vision aligned well with the ethos of Sweden, a country at the forefront of environmental consciousness and renewable energy usage. The idea was to use Sweden's abundant hydroelectric and wind power to fuel the manufacturing process. This would significantly reduce carbon emissions that are typically associated with battery production. And so Northvolt was born in 2016, a Swedish startup that five years later would be valued at $12 billion. So far, they've raised capital from the likes of BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, the European Union Investment Bank, as well as Swedish and Canadian pension funds. Northvolt has also secured $55 billion in orders from major customers like Volkswagen, BMW and Volvo, which demonstrates the market's trust and demand for the company's battery products. So how exactly are they building the world's greenest battery cell? Northvolt's key strategy boils down to two words, vertical integration. By controlling and vertically integrating the entire supply chain from the sourcing of raw materials to battery cell production, transportation of goods, and even recycling, they're able to minimize the environmental impact. This creates a powerful closed loop ecosystem. And when you do all of this at scale, you can significantly drive down production costs and boost output. A key component of Northvolt's formula is sourcing ethically mined raw materials within Europe wherever possible to reduce long distance transportation. They strategically decided to build their first gigafactory, Northvolt Et, in Cholefteo, giving them access to clean energy, a lot of land, robust power supply, and proximity to raw materials. Cholefteo is also very close to Buli de Rönnskär, one of the world's largest recyclers of electronic material. But what they probably didn't expect was that Sweden would soon make a discovery that could further amplify Northvolt and Sweden's strategic advantage. In early 2023, in the mining town of Kiruna, located not too far from Northvolt Et, state-owned mining company LKAB discovered the Pad Yeyer deposit. With 1.3 million tons of rare earths and more than two Eiffel Towers deep, this is Europe's largest deposit of rare earth elements. While the sheer size of the deposit is impressive, the fact that this discovery occurred in Kiruna, an already established mining town, is another important factor. Kiruna's already established infrastructure, skilled workforce, and mining expertise serve as a unique advantage in the development and utilization of this resource. 
and the proximity of the Pad Yeye deposit to Northvolt's operations could further streamline Northvolt's supply chain, reinforcing the company's vertical integration strategy. But you know what? Northvolt might not even need to mine raw materials in the future. In November 2023, the company announced a breakthrough in sodium ion battery technology. This type of battery doesn't involve the use of lithium, cobalt, or nickel, and its key ingredient, sodium, is abundant and widely available. This makes it a more sustainable and cost-effective alternative, perfectly aligning with Northvolt's mission. Northvolt's sodium ion batteries developed using Prussian blue analogs, a type of pigment, have demonstrated an energy density similar to conventional lithium ion batteries. This is important and suggests sodium ion batteries could soon provide a realistic alternative for large-scale applications, including grid storage and electric vehicles, without compromising performance. The rise of Northvolt and the discovery of the Pad Yeye deposit in Sweden are important steps towards a more self-reliant Europe, not just away from China, but also Russia. The European Union has historically depended on Russia for its energy supply, particularly natural gas and oil, with Russia accounting for 43% of EU's energy imports. This dependency has put the EU in a vulnerable position, especially following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And so Northvolt's technology and the local sourcing of rare earth elements from the Pad Yeye deposit could be instrumental in boosting Europe's energy security. By enhancing the EU's capabilities in renewable energy, Europe can decrease its energy dependency on Russia and strengthen its overall energy resilience and autonomy. Europe's reliance on China could undergo a similar transformation. As we've explored, China's dominance in rare earth elements and lithium-ion batteries has been a cornerstone of its global economic influence. This has been a double-edged sword for Europeans. They've received the necessary materials for technological development, but they've also created a dependency that China can leverage in diplomatic and economic negotiations. And by decreasing its dependence on China, Europe not only diversifies its supply sources, but also enhances its bargaining power and reduces potential geopolitical risks. This shift could lead to a more balanced global market where Europe can assert greater control over its technological destiny. It also sets a precedent for other regions to explore and develop their own resources, further decentralizing the global supply chain that has been so heavily skewed towards China. So in essence, the developments in Sweden could have profound implications for Europe's broader energy, technological, and geopolitical goals. It represents more than just industrial progress. It could symbolize a turning point in Europe's global strategy. But as with most innovations and new discoveries, there are of course challenges too. Developing Northwest operations to full capacity will take time and even more capital. The company has already raised $13 billion and they're going to need many billions more. Northvolt's goal is to hit 150 gigawatt hours in energy capacity for its lithium ion batteries by 2030. While this is ambitious, it's significantly less than CATL, which according to estimates is expected to hit 670 gigawatt hours by 2025. As for Parieyer, while the deposit is a great find for Europe, it's still relatively small compared to the vast rare earth mines in China. This means that, at least in the short to medium term, Europe will continue to face competition from China's well-established and expansive mining operations. Fully leveraging Parieyer will also require regulatory approval. Mining permits in Sweden can take up to 15 years to process. Either way, as Europe looks forward, it does so with two powerful weapons in its arsenal, hidden within the serene landscapes of Sweden.